Okay, I'm seeing lots of people. This is great. All right. Well, I think we're going to go ahead and get started. Um, we'll allow everyone to sort of just come in and join us as they can. Um, thank you all so much for joining us um, for the Massachusetts Rare Disease Day Rare Action Network um, webinar. Um, we're so pleased to have you all with us. Um, we'll just quickly uh, give a quick medical and legal disclosure um, that none of us um, are here to, um, Amy and I are, we'll introduce ourselves in mere moments, but we are not here to provide any medical advice. Um, we are volunteers, um, so uh, you can read the rest of the information here on the slide, but we just want to make that very clear um, and that we encourage you to uh, at your own doctor's recommendations um, for that. Thanks, Amy. Okay, hi guys. Um, let me know if there's any issues with audio or with the screen at any point in time during this presentation, but we officially want to welcome you to our early precursor to Rare Disease Day for Massachusetts. There's gonna be a ton of awesome events going on throughout the state, but we hope this will get you excited and especially um, more knowledgeable on some of the policy issues that a lot of the groups are gonna be talking about. And so um, I'm just gonna do a quick rundown of what you can expect from today. So we're gonna be doing some brief introductions. We're gonna be hearing from patients, caregivers, some individuals who are experts on working on the RDAC, the Rare Disease Advisory Council, one of the hot button issues over the past, over, over, about six years, <laughs> um, but officially this year, we were really excited about it. And we're gonna hear from some uh, research institutes, some of our wonderful legislators, and then uh, kind of go through some of the issues specific to the Rare Action Network and NORD. So to start us off, um, for anyone who doesn't know me, my name is Amy Patterson. I am a second year genetic counseling master's student and so happy to be here with you guys today. I've been involved with the Rare Action Network of Massachusetts for about three years now and um, kind of got into this rare disease space through a close family friend from who I've known since pre-K and her brother has a rare disease called congenital hyperinsulinism. So I started advocating with their family uh, at a pretty young age and this kind of led me on my path to genetic counseling and rare disease advocacy and um, am, again, just so happy to be here. So passing this over to Ty. Hi, so the um, fun irony for Amy and I is I actually now work at Congenital Hyperinsulinism International. Um, uh, and so I'm joining today from Esong Meadow, so making sure we represent Western Mass here as well. Um, I'm a recent graduate of the School of Public Health, Health Sciences at UMass PhD program, um, where I looked at health policy issues and did research um, looking at issues of access, um, structural, financial, insurance access um, for patients and uh, ways to connect with resources, treatments, and medical care. So those are some of the issues that really led me to be involved in this space, as well as some personal connections. Um, but we wanna hear from you all. So I'm going to be launching a poll today. Um, just open it up, you should see a pop-up um, to ask you, uh, what is your connection to rare diseases? Um, and where you're joining from today. So I see some of the messages are starting to come in. Um, so please go ahead and answer the poll questions. And while you are, I'm gonna just briefly tell you a little bit about Rare Disease Day in case you um, are new to this movement. So it started in 2008 in Europe through Eurotis. Um, and it's grown to, last year there were over 85 countries involved and NORD has been involved as the official US sponsor of the day um, since 2009. And one of the most exciting things is that there's so many ways for people to get involved. Um, there's some great ideas on the NORD Rare Disease Day website and on the global website. Um, and there's so many things that we um, can all do. And we'll talk about some of those at the end. But I'm going to share the results of the poll now. Um, it looks like we have some, uh, uh, some uh, solid participation. So um, can you see the poll results? 
Okay, so it looks like um, the majority today are patient or family representatives and um, then researchers and medical professionals, um, strong showing as well. And Northeastern Mass, oh, it, they always take it, don't they? Um, for those of us in the rest of the state, but um, nice to see friends from Central um, uh, Northwestern and then uh, the fans of Massachusetts, we understand. So um, thank you all for that. And um, so to, just give a little more context of Rare Disease Day and some of what's going on around the world, um, we're going to share the official video from your artists um, to talk about the campaign. Every year they do a very um, uh, beautiful video to try and um, share the story. So Amy, do you wanna go ahead and launch that? Yes, and actually before I do so, I meant to say this earlier that, and Kristen put it in the chat, that we have our wonderful policy team from Nord um, manning the chat box here. Um, Kristen, Elise, and Amanda. And so if you have any questions or comments or just wanna say something about rare disease, uh, feel free to utilize the chat. Um, for the most part, we're not gonna be answering questions during this whole action-packed hour, but there will be time most likely at the end that we can address questions. And again, the policy team can talk about anything in the chat. So um, please just keep yourselves muted as much as possible. Uh, if there is any issues with audio um, during these videos, feel free to unmute and, and kind of shout out, say something, let me know that something's not working, okay? Great. I am Tristan. Angelina. Namaste, Shafiq. Regina. Habari asubui, Javi. Jag är en kristen och jag bor i Norge. I live in the United States of America. In Australia. Malaysia. No Brazil. Tunisia, Kenya. My passion is for fashion and design. I love to dance. Minha sorotan. Para viajar e descobrir novas culturas. Ana penda kunitazama niki poliza mapovu. Ya el querida, os pelos pelo meu família mesmo. Minhas paixões são minha fuga quando as coisas estão difíceis. Ada hari harinya apabila melakukan perkara yang biasa akan jadi sangat susah. When your disease makes you feel isolated. It's difficult to walk. O var me pulogue. When I'm tired. Afraid. O controle da doença pode ser desafiador. Atau mengecewakan bila saya kehilangan masa. Muda muhimu sana. But we learned to be resilient. Para apreciar os pequenos detalhes que me trazem alegria. Kumuona mtoto wangu wa kiume anavifurahi tunapoenda nje. Nikijua anasikiza hadithi na sauti zilizo karibu. Mencari titik perhubungan dengan masyarakat yang tak pernah saya sedar wujud. Their fierce support. Sua bondade inabalável. Keluarga. Enfermeiras. Doctors. Support workers. Assistentes. Mashirika ya wagonjwa. Together, we are a strong community. Nimeweza kuelekewa. Histórias compartilhadas que me libertaram das dúvidas. Oh, como se ele te lhe... I am Tristan. I live with sickle cell. I'm Angelina. And she has CASC, a neurological disorder. Saya Shafi. Dan saya hidup dengan ectodermal dysplasia. Regina, eu tinha leiomiosarcoma, um câncer raro. Who you me Harvey? Ana SMA, spinal muscular atrophy. You and Christian, oh yeah, har ui, me fa pensurat. Esta é minha vida. Suara saya. And I am more than my disease. We are rare. Kami ramai. Nós somos fortes. And we are proud. I am Tristan. Sorry about that. Okay, so guys, thank you so much for watching that and joining us in that. Um, those videos get better every year. I think um, your artist does a phenomenal job with that and painting a really global scale um, because obviously we know rare disease did not, does not just affect the US. We talk a lot about US stats, but this is, um, this is a global concern. And um, we're gonna give a little bit of a brief overview to uh, NORD and the Rare Action Network as well, just in case, I think a lot of the Rare Action Network um, things are not necessarily new to this group of people. And I'm looking around uh, in the faces in the audience and I do know a ton of you from attending our talks. We've attended some talks by you guys, um, but just as a brief overview, the Rare Action Network is 
a um, is a national initiative. It's the brand, the all volunteer advocacy branch of NORD, the National Organization of Rare Disorders, and it was put in place. And this initiation, this initiative was started. Um, I'm actually not exactly sure at this point. About six, five or six years ago at this point. Um, five years ago. Wonderful. Thank you, Kristen. And I was able to join on a, a little over uh, two, almost three years ago uh, with a wonderful team. Alan and Jen, you're going to hear from today and Megan Worth, my other genetic counseling colleague. Um, at this point in time, uh, we the goal is to get every state in the U.S. to have a rare action network, Massachusetts, just one of them. Um, and we work on state specific issues, but also engage in federal policy as well. Um, we have both a state ambassador typically and a community engagement liaison, um, one to work more on the bigger picture things and then the community engagement liaison to work like it sounds like more with the community. Um, and Ty and I are both co-ambassadors at this point in time. Um, so to get us thinking a little bit about NORD and the Rare Action Network and um, their engagement with Rare Disease Day, you're going to hear in this video a little bit from Peter Saltonstall, uh, who is the head of NORD. So. Every year on the last day of February, the National Organization for Rare Disorders joins together with others around the world to raise awareness of the challenges faced by people living with rare diseases. Achieving health equity is even more difficult for rare patients. To have equity in health means everyone has an opportunity to be as healthy as possible, regardless of social, geographic, economic, or other obstacles that may be working against them. At NORD, we appreciate your support, which allows us to work on issues like health equity and many others and for our staff and volunteers to bring them to the forefront on Rare Disease Day. From the Volunteer State Ambassadors, we would like to say thank you to all of our Rare Action Network supporters for helping us connect with rare patients and families in our states. And thank you for allowing the Rare Action Network to raise important issues with state lawmakers on Rare Disease Day and throughout the year. Did you know that in medical school, I was told when you hear hoofbeats, they think horses, not zebras. But what about the more than 25 million Americans living with a rare disease? At NORD, we are humbled to provide help and resources to our zebras and their caregivers. NORD support allowed me to catch up on some overdue bills, including my rent. Thank you for your support, NORD, and thank you for supporting Rare Disease Day. From all of us at NORD, thank you for your dedication to the rare disease community on Rare Disease Day and every day. Okay, so thank you all for watching that. I hope that gave a little bit of insight into NORD and kind of what NORD's done, especially over the past year uh, with COVID and kind of what we're excited about with Rare Disease Day. So this portion of the day is going to be dedicated to our wonderful speakers. And we are so excited to announce first that we're gonna have Alan Holbrook joining us. And for a lot of you, he needs no introduction. He has worked in this space for a long time and is really a powerhouse here. Um, so Alan, I'm really going to let you introduce yourself and kind of share your experiences. Well, thank you, Amy. Uh, let me start, first of all, I've heard Amy mention a couple of times that she's been with the organization for about two years or so. Uh, this is an example of time really passes when you're having fun because you are the first recruit that Jen and I brought on board as a volunteer, which means that you have actually been with us for about three and a half years. So- Wow, okay, time really flies, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> okay, um, as the slide says, I was uh, the previous Mass RAN ambassador before uh, I passed the position on to, uh, to Amy and to Ty, and uh, held that position for about almost four years and thoroughly, thoroughly enjoyed it. Now I was included uh, on the agenda in the uh, caregiver section, but the truth of it is I haven't been a caregiver for about eight years. 
Um, my wife passed from a rare uh, degenerative disease, frontotemporal degeneration in uh, 2013. But uh, that doesn't stop me from having been a dedicated, passionate ambassador volunteer for, for all of this. But since I haven't been a caregiver, I wanted to uh, talk today mostly about uh, my take on the Rare Disease Advisory Council, which just passed the 191st court in the Massachusetts legislature about uh, three months ago. It was one of the last things that that legislature did before it uh, adjourned. And uh, I consider that my help in getting that bill passed, whatever little bit that I, I had to do with it, is definitely the highlight of my entire career with RAN. Uh, we worked very, very hard. There were a number of people uh, who worked on this thing, and we are so pleased that it is finally being enacted into law. Uh, a little bit of the history. Massachusetts, for those of you who don't know, is on a two-year legislative system. And uh, the first RDAC legislation was introduced in the 189th court. So that was six years ago. And uh, the first introduction in the 189th court died in committee. The second introduction in the 190th court died in committee. And finally, in the 191st, uh, many, many people contributed to helping push that bill through and finally get it uh, signed into law. Now, I don't want to speculate particularly as to why the first two tries didn't make it. But I can tell you that uh, there are reasons why it finally did in the 191st. And as far as I'm concerned, one of the main reasons is that in the 189th and 190th uh, courts, there wasn't really a lot of strong ownership uh, amongst the legislators. But in the 191st, we had two absolutely fantastic legislators with us the entire way. They're on the agenda today and you will be hearing from them. But I definitely want to acknowledge um, Hannah Kane and Joe McKenna, who, if it hadn't been for them, the 191st would have been the same as the first two. We wouldn't have made it. So we owe a great debt of gratitude to these two people. Um, but in addition to having strong sponsors, uh, the main differences in the 191st court bill, Nord and uh, one of our sister organizations who's been briefly mentioned already, the uh, Rare New England, headed up by Julie Gersey. We totally rewrote the bill from the way it was the first two sessions. Uh, when we really looked at it, it became obvious there were some things in it that were preventing it from getting a lot of traction. We hopefully took care of those. Once we got the bill rewritten, we turned it over to Hannah and to Joe, and they put it into the, uh, added their sense to it and put it into the proper format that would please uh, the legislature. And uh, we got things done. So there's way too much in the bill to go into detail about it. Uh, I'm not going to be able to have the time to do that. But there are a couple of things that uh, I believe really stand out. First and foremost, in my mind, having a rare disease advisory council in Massachusetts will help dispel ignorance about rare disease. And many of you have already heard us say in various contexts that ignorance is possibly the biggest problem we have in getting the public to understand rare disease. So we're going to be taking care of that and uh, hopefully uh, giving a voice that way to the 65 to 70,000 people in Massachusetts who have a rare disease. Secondly, uh, getting into the meat of it, it's going to help organize Massachusetts to better respond to the needs of the rare disease community. It's going to help uh, organize and guide the myriad of organizations, many of which are represented here today, but who don't necessarily coordinate or talk to each other. And the RDAC will help get them together onto that same page, make them stronger, get more of a uh, 
more of a presence for them and go on. So uh, am I getting the hook already, Amy? No, Alan, I'm sorry to interrupt you. I realized people didn't get to see your face to the fullest extent, so I stopped sharing my screen. So my <laughs> apologies there. Okay. So uh, going on, the Rare Disease Advisory Council is uh, going to be composed of a great deal of people who are really relevant to the process, that healthcare professionals, doctors and nurses, uh, researchers who are working to find cures, representatives from the patient organizations. Uh, I'd like to particularly acknowledge Ty in this because of uh, her role in working in the field. And uh, possibly most importantly, it's going to contain, there will be spots on it for actual patients and caregivers, which means that the voice of real people with real rare diseases will be heard and will help manage and guide the, uh, the process. Um, since none of this is free, and this is all going to, uh, to cost some money, the bill also allows for the council to solicit funding uh, to do its work, which means that uh, it's not going to be a burden, hopefully, to the, uh, the taxpayer and the Commonwealth. And the funding will come from grants and other, uh, other academic and such sources and funding. Now the council is not, and this has to be understood, a silver bullet that will really slay the rare disease beast in Massachusetts quickly and easily. But it will be a major step forward. It will take some time for the council to come up with a program, figure out how to implement it and get it going. But it is a start, and it's a start that we haven't had any time before this. Thank you Finally, so I much, Alan. To... Pardon? I'm sorry? I was saying thank you so much, and we'll give a little more information about the bill, about the actual RDAC in a little bit as well. Okay, well, I'm going to run just a slight bit over because I want to, the final thing I want to do is acknowledge the real heroes in the RDAC, and that is all of you people who joined us, who supported us, and who helped it pass. Thank you. Thank you so much, Alan. That was awesome. Our next speaker is um, Jen Melanson. Again, a lot of you probably have seen her speak and tell her story in the past as well. Um, Jen Melanson is a licensed social worker serving as the community services coordinator for the town of Chelmsford. She's been active in the rare disease community, um, <clears throat> in the rare disease advocacy since 2009. And like Alan said, is one of the people who recruited me because she was a former RAN ambassador. She's gonna be completing her MSW in May and is currently applying to social work PhD programs with a research focus on medical trauma. So Jen, please take it away. And I am gonna unshare my screen so that again, people can see your lovely face. <laughs> Thanks, Amy. Um, thanks for inviting me here today. And it's so great to see so many um, familiar faces. It feels a little bit like coming home. So um, this, is, this is great and so great to see uh, lots of new faces too. So um, as Amy mentioned, I'm a former um, RAND co-ambassador as well, served with Alan. Alan and I were uh, the first two ambassadors in the position for um, Massachusetts, and I think we made a pretty darn good team. Um, Alan, you know, talked about um, his his efforts in um, advancing the RDAC regis legislation, and um, you know, he and I often teamed up and would visit legislators together he would sort of take the RDAC piece of legislation and my focus would be um, step therapy legislation, which unfortunately did not get passed um, with the RDAC legislation. However, um, I am not giving up and I'm still for full force pushing for step therapy legislation. Um, so, so stay tuned because I, I plan on, you know, helping get that through. Um, but a little bit about me and, and how I entered the um, rare disease world. So um, I have a, an ultra rare genetic disorder, immunodeficiency disorder called CTLA4 haploinsufficiency. It only affects about 400 people worldwide. Um, unfortunately, I passed it along to two of my three children. 
Um, it's a genetically dominant disease. Um, and it's also something that took the life of my father at the age of 41. Um, for a long time, we didn't know um, um, that we had this disorder. It really wasn't, it wasn't discovered until 2014. My father died in um, 1995, so he never really had a chance. Um, I had significant health issues for for much of my life, really, starting from the time I was 16 when I had thyroid issues. And, um, you know, I, I kind of bounced from physician to physician treating, you know, all of these different things that were sort of seemingly unrelated. Um, and then a few years ago, my son, my youngest son, who was um, 16 at the time, developed some symptoms of his own that were seemingly very unrelated to what I had going on. Um, but we took him to Children's Hospital um, because it just was stuff that was a little bit unusual and, and his um, clinical presentation was not giving a, a clear picture of what was going on. And he, we got really lucky and, got, and ended up um, in treatment with a really smart rheumatologist at Children's who started, uh, suspected some sort of genetic disorder and started doing some genetic testing. And she was the one who hit on um, this disorder, the CTLA-4 haploinsufficiency, um, and also knew that given my health history, it was likely that it had come from me. And so we brought the entire family um, in for testing and that was how we found out my other son had it as well. So um, what does, you know, all of this have to do with sort of my, my passion um, for advocacy and my connection and my, my, um, my, my pleasure at the creation, creation of the RDAC? Well, um, what it led to for my family was not only sort of a definitive diagnosis and explanation of what was going on, both in my son and also with me, with my health issues, it also provided some closure for me as far as surrounding the death of my father um, and always sort of feeling like there was some sort of connection between what I had going on and, and what had um, gone on with him as well. Um, but really what it, what it did most importantly was it identified potential treatments for us, treatments that could, um, that could change our lives. And it really connected for me the importance of um, research in rare disease, in the rare disease world, and um, treatments in the rare disease world. And for anybody here who's living with a rare disease, um, if, if it's something that's identified and has a potential treatment, you know how important that treatment is. If it's something that doesn't have a potential treatment, you probably know even more how important it is to, to find a treatment. Um, and so my hope with the, with the RDAC, and, and I think part of the intention of the, of, of the Advisory Council, is to really tap into um, you know, expanding research in the rare disease realm and then connecting to new and better um, treatments. And I think an important aspect of that is, um, you know, for many of us with rare diseases that have treatments, um, they may be treatments that they often are treatments that are not actually um, approved for the treatment of our rare disease because there just isn't a lot of research, um, you know, to connect the two. And so, using off-label treatments can be very difficult to get insurances to cover, um, but they can be absolutely life-changing and life-saving as they have been um, from my family. So my hope is through the council, we can increase awareness of off-label treatments and their importance in treating rare diseases. Thank you so much, Jen. I mean, you brought up some wonderful um, legislative topics that I think we're going to really be working on over the next year. So thanks for setting that stage. Um, for our next speaker, we're going to be hearing from Kita. Kita is Next Step's resident people person responsible for connecting young people and their providers to our programs. And she herself is living with a rare genetic disorder. Kita merges her two passions of theater and healthcare education by engaging youth in expressive arts to work with them to take ownership of their narratives. Um, she is all about having young people get into the conversations that matter to them. 
Kita has a BA in theater studies and a BS in anthropology from the University of Utah and a master's in public health from Boston University. Also as an awesome plug, which I checked out earlier today um, and in the past, <laughs> uh, she has a TEDx talk um, that you can find on YouTube or the TED site on the importance of first impression and implicit bias. So I'm gonna turn it over to Kita. Thank you so much, Amy. That was so nice. Um, uh, like, like she said, I'm Kita. I use the she, her pronouns. Um, I myself am living with a rare genetic disorder called pycnodysostosis. It is also very rare. It's like one in two million um, about. So it is quite rare, but you know, I'm, I'm, I'm here. I'm, I'm rocking it. it. It causes brittle bones and dwarfism. So um, that's a little about me. But so growing up with a rare condition, I got into the advocacy world because I knew what it was like to be a young person who felt isolated, um, just disempowered, not knowing where to turn, who to talk to, where my voice would be heard. And so I work for Next Step, which is a organization that works with teens and young adults who have rare disorders. And we like to bring these young people together to let them know that their voice matters, that their lives matter, that they still can have awesome, enriched, powerful, successful lives and however they want to define it themselves. We work mainly in Massachusetts area, but we work nationally, globally now because everything is redesigned to be 100% virtual. And so we do a variety of workshops with these young people to, to again, get them to, to know they're not as isolated. They, they're with each other, they're with their peers. They can learn from each other, with each other. And we just try to kind of help facilitate and guide these conversations with them, for them. Um, but what I'm really excited about with this RDAC is that our young people can now take their concerns and, and their wants and their needs and, and all that things to somewhere. So we've had groups about legislation in the past and why a young person, especially why their voice matters, why their vote matters, why every little thing. And we've written letters about why we need more access to mental health, especially because as a young person, when you're dealing with a rare disorder and you feel isolated, you feel stigmatized, you feel so disempowered, that can have a really big impact on your mental health. And so when there's not equitable access to mental health resources, that can continue to spiral your health. So when you're having a mental health moment or, or, or a diagnosis or something that can also impact your physical health. So we, that's just one of the little things that we talk about. We also talk about the difference of accessibility and accommodations, both in the workplace and at school, how to advocate for yourself in those ways. And so to be able to come to the RDAC with our concerns about ways that we can increase accessibility, increase awareness, increase research, all those things, like I'm just so excited that this got passed and was created because now my young people know that there is somewhere specifically for them to go to. Um, we're, we're at Next Step, we have a big push to get our young people more involved legislatively so that they can see how much their voice matters and how much they can impact the change they want to see. Kita, thank you so much. That is awesome. And I would also definitely add, Kita mentioned Next Step. Um, I would absolutely go check out their website. There are tons of great resources for young people um, and they engage so many people around the Boston area and greater Boston area. So thanks, Kita. Okay. And so now we are gonna transition um, to a slightly different focus here. We heard from our awesome last three speakers, and thank you guys again. Um, we're gonna start hearing from some of the research centers that are focused on rare disease. So I'm gonna turn it over to Jill and Casey from the Manton Center for Orphan Disease Research at Boston Children's Hospital. Hey, uh, thanks for inviting us today to be a part of this great event. It's a real pleasure to be here. I'm Jill Madden, and I'm joined by my colleague, Casey Gennetti, who you'll be hearing from in a moment as well. We are both project managers and genetic counselors with the Manton Center for Orphan Disease Research. The Manton Center is a philanthropically funded center at Boston Children's. Um, 
we were established in 2008 to improve our understanding and awareness of rare diseases. And so this includes funding rare disease research projects, uh, as well as serving as a starting point for other clinicians and researchers that want to get in this area and maybe have a particular interest, but maybe don't have the resources or kind of know where to start or um, get to be kind of a petri dish to, to let them grow on that project and, and facilitate that research. Um, and much of our time uh, is also spent helping families and individual individual patients find a genetic explanation for undiagnosed conditions. So like Jen mentioned, um, often in the clinic, um, you can get genetic testing and sometimes um, it works in the clinic and other times um, the testing in the clinic is not able to find the diagnosis and families are referred on to us in the research world to do some broader testing. Um, and so to date, uh, we have over 2,100 families enrolled in the Manton Center. They've been enrolled from all 50 states as well as 53 countries. So while we work closely with the physicians and clinicians at Boston Children's Hospital, we are able to assist families across the country and globally as well. Um, and really, as you know, in, in the rare disease community, there's a lot of power um, in, in reaching globally as well. So we really enjoy that part of our job too. Um, and we're really thankful for these families that are participating in research. And we really hope that our work will directly benefit them as well as contribute to our broader understanding of genetics and rare disease. As I mentioned, kind of as the testing has evolved in the clinic, um, initially when we were founded, we were doing a lot of the broad genetic testing because it wasn't available in clinic. But now the clinics are offering some of these big broad genetic tests, um, which is great and um, really shows how fast the the field is moving, um, but sometimes that still doesn't yield a diagnosis, unfortunately, but we're actually able to obtain that genetic data and review it in different ways. And sometimes that leads to us being able to um, find novel diagnosis or maybe overlooked diagnoses. Um, because the field is changing rapidly, it, it really pays off to keep looking at this information as new genes are discovered. Um, and so when these novel reasons are found. We're also able to help facilitate collaborations with other researchers and, and clinicians to help learn more about these um, conditions. And it really provides us a unique opportunity for us to work with scientists and clinicians and patients, again, kind of around the world to really help learn about these rare conditions and then get that information back to families. Um, and so I'll pass it off to Casey, um, who will share a little bit more about these aspects of the Manton Center. Thank you so much, Jill. Um, just to kind of echo what Jill was saying, the Manton Center really was developed to serve as a resource to further our progress in rare disease. So a lot of that has to do with the research that we're doing, um, but we also do try to serve as advocates as well from research and, and academia kind of as a whole um, and provide a voice and support for things like RDAC um, by providing letters of support um, and being kind of the research and academic voice behind some of these movements to help show our support as well to kind of round out the patient and, and other um, advocacy groups that are working in this direction, which is, um, you know, really exciting that this has passed. And so in addition to kind of helping on an individual basis with, basis with patients and families and trying to understand or find a new diagnosis, the Manton Center is also important because we're establishing kind of a broad rare disease biorepository um, of patient clinical histories and genetic information and samples. And that can be leveraged uh, by clinicians and researchers um, that have specific interests in rare diseases to try to push their research forward and accelerate that, um, both here at Boston Children's, um, but, and as well as Jill kind of mentioned with our external collaborators as well. And we're also trying to grow our collaborations with industry for, with things like biopharmaceutical companies who may have interests in particular rare conditions um, and try to create that link between those industry partners, academia, um, and the, uh, the rare disease patients and communities and try to really accelerate the development of therapies. Um, we recognize that when working with rare diseases, um, there's a great power in collaboration and data sharing um, in order to strengthen our numbers um, and accelerate progress. So much of these um, collaborations also have to do not only with understanding these rare diseases, but taking things to the next level as well, which I think we'll hear about in our next talk um, and starting to develop 
therapies. Um, ultimately, um, as Jen said too, after finding a diagnosis, that's our next goal. Um, and so we hope that our biorepository and our work that we're doing um, will help in the development of kind of the early stages or preclinical stages of therapy development, like genetic therapies, um, as well as finding potential new drug targets. Um, these, this access to patient samples and clinical information is a really critical resource to our clinicians. Um, so we just wanna, again, say a big thank you to families who are involved, not only in our research, but just in research in general, um, having that access for researchers to work with patient samples and better understand individual cases um, is huge. So we thank you for all of your research participation you've done in the past and in the future. Um, and we thank uh, the Rare Action Network for being a great collaborator with us um, for many years past and, and for in the future too with these great rare disease events. Thank you guys both for speaking. And, and I also wanna shout back out a thank you to you guys. Um, it's been really helpful uh, to have support from the Manton Center in putting on a rare disease event in person in past years at Boston Children's Hospital. And that's been a really, really wonderful um, way to bring families together. So thank you guys. Um, it sounds like this is a perfect transition to start talking about the, um, the Lee Weibo Institute for Rare Diseases Research and turn it over to Dr. Gao. So thank you so much for joining us, Dr. Gao. Thank you. Let me see whether I can share my screens. Looks like I can. Okay. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Guangping Gao. I'm the professor and director of a whole Gene Therapy Center. And what I'm going to talk to you about a brief introduction um, on the Li Weibo Institute for Rare Disease Research. And this uh, is uh, really focused on uh, rare diseases, uh, you know, strong focus uh, at the UMass. And this is established in 2017 with a $10 million uh, donation from Mr. Weibo Li uh, uh, Charitable, Charitable Foundation. And uh, my, my colleague, uh, Dr. Michael Green, MD, PhD, and myself are serving as uh, co-directors uh, for this uh, institute. So uh, this institute for rare disease research, as you know, we have more than 7,000 conditions that have been diagnosed as a rare disease. disease. And as our institute's mission is to uh, synergize the effort from 45 researchers, uh, clinicians, and physician scientists to unlock the cause and develop the cures for rare diseases. And we, these, uh, you know, this support from Mr. Weibo Li and from other uh, uh, efforts uh, from UMass Medical School, we award two rare disease research grant each year to our institute members through a very competitive process. And this institute actually, uh, we bring together 45 laboratories from 20 departments, programs, and institutes at UMass Medical School as is showing here. And so the key strengths for our research disease research at UMass Medical School includes first understanding disease pathomechanisms and screening therapeutic genes or druggable targets. The second is model organisms research and IPS, patient IPS cells, small and large animal model modeling for rare disease. This includes from mouse, uh, C. elegans, uh, and uh, zebrafish uh, to uh, as big as a sheep. Um, so, so those are the animal modeling. And then another important part is delivery the rare disease drugs to uh, our patients. And that's a major strength here. And also we develop the methodologies for safe and efficient drug delivery to the patient. What I really want to uh, emphasize here is our Hori Gene Therapy Center is an international well-known uh, center with uh, uh, state-of-art viral gene delivery 
technology platforms. So now I finally going to summarize our approaches to treating rare genetic diseases. And so the first is when you have some genetic diseases, your gene will lose the function to produce the protein, RNA, whatever you need for your life. So one thing you can do is do gene replacement. In this case, we deliver a normal functional gene into human cells to accomplish therapy. That's called the gene replacement. Second strategy is when you have a mutation that causes toxicity, cause a gain of function, gain of toxicity, then what we could do is to deliver a gene silencing molecule to lock down this toxic gene to prevent it generate the toxic effect in your body. The third one is called the gene addition. You may or you may not have this particular gene run, but by supply this particular gene overexpress it, it may help you to uh, treat your disease. They finally, it's currently most popular, well, very sexy wave of genetic technology that is gene editing. Here you can do in change the genetic codon or, or products uh, your cells directly. So what I want to emphasize is this gene silencing technology, it's really our UMass Nobel laureate technology, and we are, uh, Dr. Craig Mallow uh, really uh, discovered uh, this technology, developed this technology. So we are taking fully advantage of that with Dr. Craig Mallow's uh, uh, expertise and develop the therapy to treat many re uh, rare diseases. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dr. Gao. That was an awesome, awesome overview on the Lee Weibo Rear Disease Institute and um, provided, sorry, and provided a really nice overview of kind of the next step of the process after diagnosis. So um, we're gonna move forward and talk to some of our awesome legislative champions. Um, and uh, I'm gonna end up turning it over to Representative Hannah Kane and Representative Joe McKenna to talk about their experience with the advocacy for the Rare Disease Advisory Council. Great, thank you so much, Amy. And it's great to be here with all of you uh, this afternoon. And I'm thrilled to be here with my uh, legislative colleague and partner and friend, uh, Rep. Joe McKenna as well. Um, so, you know, Alan gave a great overview um, of the effort to get the bill passed and, uh, I've been the ranking minority member on public health for four sessions now, and I actually heard this bill as a member of public health when it was brought forward uh, before Joe and I got involved in it. And I thought it was a great bill and incredibly important. And so when our colleague who had first uh, brought the bill forward uh, decided to go be mayor instead of a state representative, uh, Joe and I uh, wanted to work together to see if we could get this bill um, out of committee and through the legislature and worked very closely with so many different advocates, um, including the members of the Rare Action Network, uh, Rare New England, NORD, as well as many partners um, in the life sciences and healthcare institutions. But most importantly, were the advocates who are either rare disease patients themselves or caregivers. Uh, those voices are always the most impactful voices uh, in terms of moving legislation forward. Uh, for me, I have uh, one of, I have three children and my middle daughter uh, suffers from true chronic diseases. They're not rare. It's rarer to have both of these diseases together at the same time. Um, but I really recognize being a caregiver, um, a lot of the challenges that are inherent when you have something as simple as a chronic disease um, that has an advocacy group devoted to it and has some treatments and cures. Um, and I recognize that if I uh, had been a parent uh, in the shoes of having somebody who had a rare disease, that I would be struggling to understand what resources were out there for me and, and how did I get attention to it. And so when I heard this bill, it really struck me as incredibly important and something that we wanted to be a part of. 
Um, and certainly when we started, uh, I think it, when we started, there was maybe five other rare disease advisory councils um, and uh, now there's 16 in just about a year's time. Um, so we're really thrilled. It was actually less than three months ago, Alan, it was on the very end of legislative session uh, that we were able to get this through. And one of the things that I always think about us as legislators is that we're really in sales. Um, and I think that there's sort of inside sales, which is what we're a part of, um, and there's outside sales, which is what you all are a part of. Um, and it takes both in order to effectively advocate and move a piece of legislation forward. One of the things that Joe and I had in, in the back of our head was um, knowledge that the last two sessions have ended uh, without chambers coming to um, a, a joint decision on major healthcare uh, bills. And that perhaps uh, the opportunity would also be not only to move this bill on its own, but also to attach it to a larger bill as an amendment um, when that would happen. And, and we early on reached out to the then majority leader who has always been involved in all things healthcare related. Um, and he became very invested in this bill. He's now Speaker of the House, um, but at the time he was majority leader. Uh, he became very invested. And we also had some great advocacy as well from MassBio um, on this bill. And so together, you know, we raised a level of awareness um, that this bill certainly had um, humanitarian and medical impact to the people who are suffering from rare disease and that that would impact um, the health care that they would get. But that there was also an, an whole economic reason to do this in terms of the investment for life sciences and in healthcare institutions and in fact driving down the cost um, of medical care, which is something that we're always trying to work on. Certainly, if we could get people diagnosed sooner, that's going to cut down on costs in our medical system. And if we have better treatments and, and cures, that too certainly helps. So we sort of took a very wide approach to it, making sure that we were advocating on all potential levers that we had. And when the, uh, the major healthcare bill uh, did move, we were actually um, welcomed by the majority leader to file this amendment. Um, he wanted to see this through. Uh, it did go into conference committee. Um, between the House and the Senate, and there was some question as to whether or not it would come out, uh, and we kept the advocacy efforts up, as did all of our external partners, uh, and we were very pleased that it was part of it in the end. So, you know, I really want to come to you today thanking you all for all the work that you did um, to help us get this bill passed. It's something that both um, Joe and I feel really, really passionate about uh, and have our own personal reasons, which I'm sure Joe will share with you as well, um, but at the end of the day, you know, we wanted to make sure that we were working to bring together um, into the room all of the people that need to be involved in these conversations. So the 29 members of the council um, were really intentional who was put on it. Um, and the appointments uh, will begin soon. As you know, it's an incredibly busy time right now for the legislature dealing with the pandemic and the administration. So um, it's going to take a while to get the 29 appointments made, um, but that is something that uh, Joe and I will also uh, keep pressure on and, and have been busy referring people in uh, to appointers uh, for their consideration. So we are hopeful um, that this will start soon and that we will really see the benefit of this close coordination among all the people that need to be at the table. And again, most importantly, um, rare disease patients and caregivers um, having a very loud voice on the RDAC that will be here in Massachusetts. So I'll turn it over to my colleague, Joe. Sounds good. And, and thank you to Alan and Jen and Keita and all of the other presenters for your great remarks earlier in the program, and especially for Alan for your very kind words uh, about Han and myself. And let me assure you, you, you very much understated your importance in the passage of this bill. Um, you did a tremendous amount to bring awareness and momentum. And as you mentioned, it was the collection of voices and advocacy that came together to, to really raise this forward that ultimately at the end of the day was more important than any rep who could have pushed it though we did have the best in Hannah uh, who really drove this and I was there to support her and, and push this forward and like with Hannah this was a personal bill for me I was a, a co-sponsor previously under Rep Haru's bill um, and when the opportunity to become a lead sponsor presented itself I jumped uh, because for me I come from a, a family with extensive hemophilia background, um, a rare bleeding disorder. And it started with my grandmother's mother and she, my grandmother became a carrier and gave it to my, my father. And his two sisters were also carriers and 
ultimately um, in the late 1980s, my father was in a um, terrible car accident that required significant amount of blood transfusion because of his hemophilia and um, unfortunately contracted HIV AIDS through tainted blood supply, which um, was a situation that affected a whole generation of those suffering from hemophilia in the late 80s and early 90s. Um, and when I think about this bill in that context, and in the context of bringing knowledge and research and education and awareness um, together into one place, I can't help but think if this had existed in the 70s and 80s, maybe a, a hematologist working on anemia would have raised a flag that said, you know what, there's, there's the possibility of transmitting um, through blood transfusion. And that would have raised a flag in, in the hemophilia world to start blood screening earlier. And so that's where I look at this RDAC and say, how can we put that sort of knowledge and awareness and collaboration together moving forward into all of the, the many, many um, families who suffer from rare diseases and make sure that we're doing the very best that we can to provide for them. And when you look at the landscape in Massachusetts with our hospitals, with our biomed companies, with our uh, universities, all of those institutions that have so much knowledge and power um, individually, how could we not do this in Massachusetts and, and bring all of that together? And for me, the, the connection with hemophilia continues. Um, my dad's two sisters were carriers, and so their two sons, my cousins, became um, uh, infected with hemophilia themselves. And then my sister was a carrier, and her, her um, second or third son, who is in the picture I just said as my background here, is the newest in the McKenna family with hemophilia. And I always like to point out, though all, all who suffer from hemophilia, uh, uh, from rare disease, um, have their struggle, hemophilia is known as the, the Royals disease, given its connection to the royal families throughout history in Russia and Portugal and Spain. So while everyone's equal, we are the royal family of, of the rare diseases. Um, and though my, my dad's story certainly had a tragic twist, I always make sure to point out the, the silver lining there in that when he was in the hospital, his attending nurse was uh, turned out to be my mom. So they connected through the tragic occurrence and that led to, to the family coming about. So there was a, a silver lining there as well. But um, I was certainly honored to, to join Hannah and to be a, one of the primary sponsors of this bill, um, was thrilled to see it pass and have nothing but gratitude for everyone in the rare disease community who lended their voices and strength and advocacy to make sure that we were able to get it over the finish line. Thank you both so much um, for your comments and for all of your work um, on behalf of the rare disease patients and families in Massachusetts. Um, it's really just amazing to hear all of the stories and to really embody the spirit of how Nord was founded about the power in people coming together. And, um, you know, from 1983, we've come so far, but there's still so much to do. Um, and so thank you both so much. And one thing I will say that, um, segment of our community that we're missing here today is um, industry, uh, but there's a great event happening on Friday. Um, we have a slide later, but um, MassBio is doing their yearly event, so we want to give a shout out to that um, because we really do need all members of this community. Um, we realize we're over time. We're going to wrap it up by 105, so stick with us if you can. We understand if you have to go, um, but we just want to give you the quick final updates on the uh, RDAC and on the state report card. So uh, if you have three or four extra minutes, we would love for you to stick with us. If not, thank you so much. Go ahead, Amy. Thank you so much, everybody. So as you can, as you've heard from most of our last, um, last speakers that our focus this year really has been on this Rare Disease Advisory Council, the RDAC, and that really kicked off our year with an amazing start. Uh, I think we all needed some good news at this point in time. So just to wrap up and reiterate what everyone's been talking about, that having a voice at the state level for the rare disease community will help um, lawmakers and policymakers, legislators, um, really be able to work with the rare disease community and hear directly from their experiences. I 
Um, optimally, the Rare Disease Advisory Council in Massachusetts, it's going to be focused on publicizing um, the profile of social and economic burdens of rare disease, uh, determining and do really studying the human impact and economic impl implications of early treatment of rare disease, and then ultimately develop recommendations to improve the quality of life of rare disease patients um, and families. Uh, and really all of society across Massachusetts. So um, we have Anissa Reed, our part of our policy team. Um, her email is down here if you have any additional questions or concerns. And then turning it over to Ty, just to give a brief overview of our state report card. Yeah, so um, NORD's policy team has done an amazing job putting out the sixth edition of the state report card. If you can jump to the next slide. Um, so they create a rubric to, to analyze key issues that impact rare disease patients. And um, just to quickly summarize where we are in Massachusetts, we're doing really well. We're A students in Medicaid financial eligibility, protecting patients in state regulated insurance. And as we've heard today, um, we now have our um, RDAC, so um, that we also are doing great. We're doing better than average. We're a B student in medical nutrition, newborn screening, and prescription out-of-pocket costs. So there's work to be done there, but we're on uh, trending in the right direction. Um, Jen earlier did a great job of talking about the importance of um, the legislation that is being looked at for step therapy. Um, right now, uh, we have an F in this area, so there's definitely a lot of work to be done, and this is an effort that I would really say um, should be a priority uh, to look at and to understand um, in the state and to bring awareness to that issue. And then um, we also did not um, do well. We failed for protecting patients in state Medicaid programs, and the reason um, in this case you receive a failing grade if the state sought and is working to implement or, or is currently seeking a waiver that contains policies capable of harming the disease community. Um, so that's just something to know about there. Um, you can go to the next slide. So if you want to learn more, um, there's a website dedicated to this, the state report card. You can look at the state and you can look at each issue and you can learn more about each issue. There's a great overview of why different states um, got different grades and why these issues matter. So um, this is a really great starting point and learning tool for all of us. Next slide. Um, and then you can contact the policy team. Um, in closing, I think that we just really want to highlight that it is, um, there's so much being done in Massachusetts, across the state, across different sectors. There's so much passion. There's so many stories that we can all learn from. Um, and we really uh, want to, uh, the old adage of alone we are rare, together we are strong, which is one of the original hashtags for Rare Disease Day, um, is something I think that we all really believe in. And we're just so grateful that you all were um, here with us today. So hashtag show your stripes, hashtag rare disease day, um, join in. There are so many ways to get involved and Amy, anything you would like to add? I would just add if anyone's still on and it has the ability um, or capacity to type on their computer, if anyone wants to add in the chat, this hashtag rare is, and then fill in the blank there, rare is beautiful, rare is strong, whatever that may be. We're going to be compiling a word cloud that we can use for social media purposes and for our um, website purposes that we can share to show the strength of our Massachusetts community. So go ahead if you are um, if you have the capacity to type, go for it and do that. And then the last thing we're going to be sharing here is that, like Ty said, there is um, a Mass Bio Rare Disease Day. The registration is still open. Um, we can share these slides or if you just Google Mass Bio Rare Disease Day, this event will happen on Friday and they always have a really wonderful showing for speakers and topics um, and will be a really nice compliment to really put together the excitement of Rare Disease Day here. So in closing here, uh, you can join the Rare Action Network if you're not already on and that'll mean that you get on our, our newsletters, the Nord newsletters, Rare Action Network, Action um, action steps or if we have any asks in terms of contacting your legislators or whatever that may be, feel free to join the Rare Action Network. Or here's our website and our contact information as well. So with that, thank you so much. Official Rare Disease Day is February 28th because it's the rarest day of the year. And we are so glad that you could join us today for our celebration. So thank you, everybody. I'll stick around and I can, um, I can be here to answer any additional questions as needed, but um, 
again. Thanks for being here. Thank you. And there are some wonderful things in the 